right. Hey, everybody. Thank you once again for joining us on the Remarkable Coach podcast. I'm your host, Michael Pacheco. And today with me, I have Millie Christman. Millie is an experienced and high energy people leader that brings work experience from startups through Fortune 100 companies to benefit small to medium sized companies, as well as individuals seeking to transition in their careers. Her direct, no-nonsense approach is geared to get results quickly and efficiently. Millie, welcome to the podcast. Michael, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, this is uh, this has been a fun one for me because um, I mean we've we, it seems like we have a lot in common. We had some chat uh, kind of before I started hitting record about um, hunting and fishing and that kind of stuff. So this is this is this is a good. One. I'm looking forward to this. But to to kind of kick off the podcast, I like to have uh, our guests just kind of tell us a little bit about themselves, um, kind of what you do with coaching, and kind of how you got into it a little bit. Uh, sure. Um, I, well, I got into HR accidentally, as have so many people. Uh, when I went to school, there really weren't degrees focused around HR. It's gone through such an evolution in the last couple of decades. It's phenomenal. It's it's fabulous. So my background is really in uh, economics and biochemistry. And so what on God's green earth does one do with that? <laughs> well, of course, one goes and works retail and, you know, until they figure themselves out. So mm-hmm. That's what I did. And in my course of retail, I was exposed to management training programs, which gave me a really good overview of of business and how to run a business, including the nuts and bolts and operations and just everything. And eventually, after going through a, a few different rotations and assignments, I landed in human resources Um, because it was an area that I hadn't been exposed to yet. And I thought, oh, let me try that out. That looks good. And I I like the person who currently was leading the function in in my division. And and she seems to really enjoy her job. She's always smiling and laughing and traveling. So how hard can that be? That's got to be a great (laughs) job. That's got to be a super duper job. So uh, I went in there and you know, a couple of things. I learned that it wasn't as easy as I was hoping it was going to be. I thought I would just sort of fly through it and then get back out into a division and, you know, run something. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I also discovered I had a real passion around learning and development. And I really understood what human resources was. it's Mm -hmm. It's a big word that I don't think a lot of people fully appreciate. There's a, a lot that goes underneath the scope and the umbrella of human resources and I just don't think people get it. And I was exposed to that. And I was really grateful, uh, unwittingly so at, at the time, and had a passion for learning and development, all things knowledge transfer, um, really, really loved it. So um, that set off my career in human resources. It was really a learning and development start. And then from there, I got into generalist positions with increasing scope and started moving around in in industry so i was in in retail and i was in consumer packaged products and from there i had uh, opportunity to get out of the industry and move into uh, a startup venture then i moved into a couple of mid-size um roles within Mm -hmm architecture within uh, fashion and distribution, mm-hmm. and then back into some very large companies uh, in in distribution and manufacturing. And one, one interesting thing I was allowed, uh, enabled to do along the way through through pretty good support and, and, and a little bit of pushing on, on my part was get out of HR because the minute I realized, gosh, I really like this thing. I, I think I wanna do this HR thing. The, my second thought was, okay, let me let me get out of it so that I can continue to sit in a couple of different chairs so that I can come back in a few years and really distinguish myself and serve clients in a much different way. So mm-hmm. when I was in human resources uh, uh, fairly early on in my career, um, I got a couple of good generalist jobs. And then after about six, seven years of experience, I moved over into a selling role mm-hmm. where I, I ran um, a, a few million dollars of, of a selling operation for a Fortune 500, a Fortune 100 company, actually, that was Coke at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I got into uh, an operations role and um, finally a supply chain role. And then after those years passed, 
I was able to get back into human resources and, and start leading functions. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I was, but I did because that's allowed my journey to uh, have my, my experience really catch up to the value propositions I, I try to commit to. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's you know, when you're serving a client that you have experienced their role, you've experienced their pain firsthand, mm-hmm. your advisory services look different. I think the way you think about things look different. The way you come up with solutions looks different. Everything looks looks different. The patience level you have for why people do or don't take your advice looks <clears throat> looks different. So I think that that uh, the ability to leave a function, experience something else and then come back to it would apply not only to HR for sure, but outside of HR as, as well. So that, that courage to sort of jump out and come back in is probably one of the most proud accomplishments I have. I would, I would tell you. So I love that that leads me to today. So I'm, I'm consulting on my own today. That's, that's awesome. I love that. I love the idea that kind of creating you know, creating a disparate background will give you this kind of idiosyncratic way of looking at problems that really is totally going to separate you from everyone else because not everyone, especially HR coaches, right? Or HR consultants, they haven't all been in sales ops and supply chain roles. What on earth possessed you (laughs) when you land? So, 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 so you land this HR gig, you realize how much you like it and you're like, I should get out of this and get more experience elsewhere. Where, where did that inspiration come from? Most people aren't going to get that or see. Well, that. I'm, I, I'm cursed by being a Virgo. So we're, <laughs> we're constantly looking at tomorrow. So sometimes the downside is that sometimes we have to slow down and look at today and go, isn't that a lovely sunset? Uh, so I'm, um, I'm oriented toward looking at tomorrow people call that having a future orientation there's here's you know, here's to earth signs i'm a taurus <laughs> oh okay well and there you have it so Slow and steady this will, this will resonate to you you know my my brain is always kind of on the horizon somewhere and my my hands and feet are usually back here grounded but my my head is somewhere out on that horizon and i was really thinking to myself oh you know, if this is what I really like, and if this is long-term, what's long-term going to look like? And so mm-hmm. my brain was just pivoting to, um, gosh, there's a lot of people that do this. How am I going to be any different? Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who are better than me, a lot of people who are smarter than me. So I think my only option is to be a little bit different because that'll appeal to a segment that is really for me. And so that's why I did it. So I, I, you know, I claim to have the idea and the guts to do it, but I really had to have the influencing skills to get folks to support that move uh, inside a firm without making me drop to the very bottom of the rung in, in sales, in operations. I was able to sort of hold my own and, and, and re- realistically, there's, um, there's, there's economic benefits from being able to do that. So um, one of the things I counsel people on all the time is the importance of having effective uh, influencing skills. And that's not Machiavellian in any sort of way. That's just the ability to convey a point of view such that the guy or the gal across the table from you can see what's in it for them. If you can create win-wins, you're going to get that movement regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I'm, I'm definitely of the belief that everyone's in sales, even if, you know, you're trying to mm-hmm. convince your spouse to go to a certain place for dinner or something. 100%. You know what I mean? It's all sales. hundred percent. Absolutely true. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you, you kind of specialize then in, right. In, in helping people, um, you know, kind of prepare for big changes, changing companies, changing industries, changing roles, kind of this career pivot stuff, right. I'm, 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 it's safe to say that you've, you've take, taken, you've learned a lot from, um, from those kind of pivots in your own career. I, I have. And I've found that people want to do that. And I felt like I had to do it, but there are people out there who want to do it mm-hmm. for um, either escaping boredom or a place where they have nowhere to go or fulfilling a need to learn. Some people are very oriented with that love of learning 
either way, the result is the same. They want to move from a current state to a, a desired future state. And I, and I have done that. And I've had, uh, I've had uh, experiences that have been easier and some that have been tougher. And I've learned from, from both. I tend to learn more from the tougher experiences for some strange reason, but um, I, I feel very well positioned and I feel really good about being able to help folks think about um, the how against the what they want to achieve and attain. And it's, it's great fun for me because I'm starting to um, expand to see folks who are really wanting to take some drastic career changes and industry changes. And um, I'm, I'm working with a client now in, in that kind of a capacity. So I'm really excited to see where this journey is going to take is going to take both of us. I feel like I'm, you know, I'm always in it with there with, with the same, with that client, like their win is my win. So it's, yeah. it's, you can impact somebody's day-to-day career like that. So who is your, who is your ideal client? Oh, gee, you know, I'm honestly, I'm trying to still figure that out because uh, I've had such a diverse diverse basket of them. So, um, you know, relative to an advisory service, uh, I really benefit most the smaller businesses who don't quite yet have the infrastructure or maybe the top line revenue stream to create a human resources department. Maybe they have one person doing payroll and, uh, Lord help them on the rest. Um, and, and, and that's where their model is right now, but they're on a growth trajectory. Their, their, uh, their top line is on a healthy cadence. And then eventually they'll get to the point where they can build that, that infrastructure out. So I would come in and that, and that could be defined by a, a certain number of headcount, but not limited to that. It could be defined by a top line revenue growth or um, a, a cash flow number. There's a lot of different metrics that go into that, but mm-hmm. it, people, <laughs> owners, owners know when they're ready. Owners know when they've hit that that precipice where mm-hmm. um, they are just going to become uh, bigger than when they started. You know that that milestone. And sure. so that's when I jump in. I work with the owners and I talk through, hey, what does this look like in terms of your people? What does it look like? And we do touch operations and we touch sales because people do all those things and all those things generate the cash that serves to fund the, the enterprise. Yeah. So um, it, it's, it's a bit of a, um, I hate to overuse the word strategy because people use that all the time, but it really is just about partnering with CEOs to think through what their tomorrow is going to look like when they're that, when they're that size. And eventually the, the, the goal is to outgrow me. Mm-hmm. You outgrow me and you build capability at the same time. So I, we, I, I take your person, I work with them, help them think through the bodies of knowledge that comprise HR, what are all the different tactical things, get the foundations built so that you can scale up. And then when you do scale up and you start needing forward thinking, we either hire in somebody if you're ready for uh, an HR manager um, or we figure out another another structure, but we get your structure figured out such that I can wean myself out and you keep growing. And then I move on to, you know, the other clients that are sort of in that in that position. So it's okay. it can be a solopreneur um, who's looking for just some thoughtware around their business, uh, or somebody who's established and maybe has 25, 30, 70, 80, 90 people on the books. So are you, what is a typical, I mean, it sounds like maybe there isn't a typical, what is one example of a typical um, kind of uh, engagement with you look like? Are are you helping, for example, are you helping people um, plan out hiring processes specifically, or are you focused on people currently in the company and, and um, that kind of Um, stuff or. Yeah, currently. Well, I have a couple of different, um, service offerings. So if it's typically, if it's career coaching, it's typically one-on-one and helping you get from where you are now to wherever you want to be, whether that's a pivot or 
prospering your current career or what have you. Mm -hmm. If it's working with a company and with a business owner, then it's typically looking at your existing current assets. What are they doing for you? Where are your pain points? Is there a connectivity between your pain point and a people process? And Mm -hmm. and usually there is. Mm -hmm. Usually there's some kind of a capability. So we identify that and we get a plan around that. Mm-hmm. And if I can, and if there's some structural thing missing that I can build, great. If we need to pull in experts from somewhere else, that's great too. But we, but we figure, we figure that out. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it kind of depends on on the offering that that's at hand, um, and also just making sure that as you grow a company, you are growing in compliance. There's a certain amount of foundational not sexy at all, uh, <laughs> sort of icky stuff that's really critical to business that you got to be on and you got to follow. And I, I just make sure that those things are set so that we mitigate any potential legal potholes that you may step in. Mm-hmm. And if there's any um, counseling or training or shoring up of capabilities in, in frontline supervisors, we do that. We just, we just get these small businesses with great ideas and great services and great products. We just get them buttoned up from an, from a human resources operations perspective. And then hopefully that can contribute to that top line, which can then allow us to start thinking about what their infrastructure should look like Mm -hmm. against a growth model. Okay. Okay. And, And then ultimately they can hire in and they can, they can afford to staff their own, HR function that takes care of creating a people first culture where you can maximize productivity and throughput and output and minimize retention and make it a great place to work and and all those things. So I sort of have to look at where they are to give them what they need. And with small businesses, they're just all in such different places. Um, that's the one thing I've learned. So it's it's a little hard to to generalize. So a lot of <clears throat> a lot of our listeners and viewers are going to be somewhere between the solopreneur and the solopreneur range, and let's say, you know, maybe two to four uh, full time employees, or maybe maybe solopreneur with a, with a VA. Um, mm-hmm. So what kind of what are some typical you know uh, problems or, or or you know roadblocks that you help Um, businesses of that size overcome? Well, the first thing we do is we sit down and we say, we ask, uh, are you, are you happy with where you are now? If yes, what, what is making you happy? Tell me specifically, what are those things? Those are, those are strengths. And then I put those in the back of my head because strengths are things to be leveraged. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about what things could be going better smoother, quicker, faster, what Mm -hmm. pain points might you have? What keeps you up at night? And we identify those things and we, we root cause analyze them to determine if they are grounded in uh, a a people, a process or a thing, like a thing being say equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you, do you have capital constraints? Is supply chain affecting you or is there a retention issue? Is there an employer branding issue? Is there a, um, is your, is your product gaining or losing relevancy? Ain't nobody staying the same in the marketplace. So, you know, a lot of those things. And, and sometimes um, there might be a need for me to help a client open up my network with, some partial advice um, from a a, a fractional CMO or a fractional CFO. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes there's a, there's a partnership with that kind of a person as well. It depends on what the need um, it it depends on what the need really is because with solopreneurs, they uh, typically I'm going to generalize here, but they typically are, are phenomenal ideators they are great risk takers. They have a they have a stomach for it. They have an appetite for it. They're typically good persuaders and influencers. Mm-hmm. They are not always strong in other very critical t- uh, key technical areas like um, finance, particularly cash flow. Mm-hmm. That's the most critical element of finance, in, in my opinion, that I've I've seen. 
and, and marketing. Um, you know, how to identify your ideal client, how to do proper messaging. I had a conversation this morning with a, a fractional CMO around how much of a challenge messaging is for folks. And yeah. um, in fact, she's looking at writing a program about it. And anyway, um, messaging, uh, strategic narratives, you know, there's, there's a lot of those things that, that um, I also can offer to a solopreneur to uh, at a minimum help him think about his business multidimensionally mm-hmm. and then start prioritizing where do you want to make the next investment? What's the most critical? Mm-hmm. So, um, It's a lot of questioning around what, what's giving you the most pain and yeah. if solved, what would give you, we think the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. Because typically when we're working with entrepreneurs at this stage, it's all about short-term wins. It's lovely to have the goal for seven years out. We want to be the biggest X, Y, Z on the planet. But right now life matters quarter to quarter because it could be uh, death. I have definitely found in, in my business and I have uh, three uh, full-time employees, not including myself. And I have found that we even, even a two-year goal, two years out is just not particularly helpful nope. for us. Nope. It's just, it's just not. Um, no, you got, you got to go uh, quarter to quarter. I do believe in having an overarching uh, mission and, and vision of where you want to be. Um, but I also believe in a lot of flexibility in being able to change those things as, as you learn. I mean, I've seen it in my own business. What I, what I started with in this business looks very different right now um, from a um, service package offering, from a, from, from a pricing model. Uh, it's, it's just changed so much. And it's changed primarily because I've uh, gone after getting feedback from the end user. Mm-hmm. The client, the customer, the end user, whatever you want to call it, that feedback is what is absolutely mission critical. Sure. And, uh, and and then there's employee feedback for, for those uh, clients of mine that, that have employees. It's employee mm-hmm. feedback because either what you're doing is working mm-hmm. for them or not working for them or working for the customer or not working for the customer from, from their point of view. So mm-hmm. those are the data points to look at. When you say working or not working for the employees, for example, are you talking about like company culture here specifically, or are you talking about something else entirely? No, I, I'm talking about um, company culture because if an employee is in a position where they are selling a product or a service mm-hmm. and they either don't completely understand it, don't completely believe in it, or they themselves have been turned off <clears throat> by customer feedback that they get. Mm-hmm. And that shakes their belief in the product. Mm-hmm. I don't care how persuasive they're going to be. If they don't have that full in dedication, yeah. they are not going to optimize their skill sets. So you've got an employee that is not running on all eight cylinders. Now, they may be running on seven, or but they might be running on two. Mm -hmm. either way you are paying for eight and and you're not getting it. So there's a, there's a, an operational uh, upside down to that. Mm -hmm. And that is why I really think being able to get feedback from employees and customers on a regular basis Mm -hmm. uh, as a part of your normal operating practice. And, and that's not even HR. That to me is ops. That's operational. That has, that needs to just be part and parcel to how, how we all, we all function mm-hmm. truthfully. Yeah, I agree. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you go about uh, with feedback from cu- clients and customers? Do you use like MPS scores or something, something different? Um, I've built uh, internal ways for companies to seek that feedback. Okay. Sometimes net promoter score um, is a little, um, is a little too, how do I put this? Uh, it's a 50,000 foot view. It's not very specific. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a little too fortune 50 sometimes okay. for small businesses. Uh-huh. Um, honestly, the point where you need to almost be as blunt by saying, um, 
if my product or service disappeared tomorrow, what effect would it have on you? That's that's an answer that is quite telling because you're like you're that. hoping you're hoping that the, that your client or customer is going to say something that will enable you to know that you would have a great that your loss your absence would have a great impact. Yeah, so it's kind of like that old Hertzberg theory from a thousand years ago in psychology of dissatisfiers. But anyway, that's, that's my nerdy side coming out. No, no, but, no. Let's, let's talk about, that sounds interesting. Can you elaborate on what that is? I have never heard of that before. Oh gosh. It's, it's an old theory and I'm going to get the decade wrong, but I'm going to think, I think it's from the fifties when um, dissatisfiers are, are things that are just, you're expected to have and you don't necessarily appreciate them while they're there, but in their absence, your world falls apart. For example, if you don't get your paycheck on time uh-huh. and it's not direct deposited and, and you expect it, you're, you're, you're not going to be a happy camper. You, sure. Somebody's going to hear about it. However, if it gets there on time, you're not going to think much of it. You're going to go about your way, pick up your dry cleaning, pet your dog, uh-huh. uh, you know, take your jog around the block. You're going to do your, your, you're going to do your thing, but it's only in its absence that it is felt. And, yeah. and sometimes I think that theory applies for service businesses that in their absence, we can really learn true, true value. Like um, so those are the things I think about. And I try to, I, I, I think that with smaller businesses, the more simple I keep things and the less um, corporate jargon that's used, mm-hmm. the more real it seems, the mm-hmm. more down to earth, the more grounded and, and just the more aligned it seems to be with, my uh, set of clientele mm-hmm. and, and, and therefore more effective because it'll get done because I'm not the one doing the interfacing. Mm-hmm. I might help design the tool, help them design a tool, but then somebody else is going to have to carry it out yeah. and, and, and get and engage and, and get the data. So I'm there to provide the thoughtware. I think, I think, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think what you're talking about and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, I'm, I'm open to being wrong, but I think what you're talking about is almost just like the user journey and user experience or client or customer experience, it, right? It is. It is. And from an HR perspective, of course, that translates into the employee experience, yeah. which is really the only thing that matters at the moment in this, in this labor market is yeah. employee experience. And if, if HR folks in companies that are big enough to have an HR department are not thinking about the employee experience, then they are, they are moving backwards and they are moving backwards fast. And they should probably step aside because there's going to be a lot of companies that pass them up for talent. Yeah. Yeah. I think if, uh, if, if happy wife equals happy life, then happy employees equals happy customers. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And yeah. I do agree with that. So <laughs> the, answer, the answer is yes squared. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and my, my husband modifies it. He says, happy spouse, happy house. There you go. Yeah. Same, same idea. Beautiful idea. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that's great. And, 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 you know, even in, in my company at Boxer, we, we do the same thing with our clients. And I honestly, I think this translates to companies at any level, taking away some of that jargon and just meeting your customer where they're at. Just this morning, we were working on a client's website and looking at the customer journey and they had an FAQ. Mm-hmm. Um, on their on their main menu, or in their about us section somewhere on their website, and uh, we just made a slight little little change there. And instead of we took out the FAQ and just changed it to your questions answered, and it's just it's a little more conversational. It's a little more colloquial. You know, yeah. it's a little bit easier to you know exactly. Well, just, I'll I'll give you an example of warmer. a similar thing. Um, I was working on something as part of foundationally shoring up the client. Mm-hmm. And I was uh, doing a handbook for this, for this client. And, and I said, I, I tell you what, if we want to create a people first culture, why not, why not get rid of calling it a handbook? Cause seriously, who's going to, who's going to read a handbook? That's just ick. Yeah. And this particular client is a, a creative guy. He's progressive, great, you know, terrific mm-hmm. deep, deep thinker. And so I said, why don't we just call it a playbook? instead. So sure. something as simple as calling it a playbook and infusing a little bit of humor, infusing a little bit of the origin story in the company, mm-hmm. and then um, talking about 
how to distribute this so that people will actually look at it and will actually read it. Meanwhile, it's a really important um, legal document to have that serves yeah. to, to set the stage for how folks are going to behave and not behave and what are the consequences uh, in the event that we depart from that um, expected behavior. So, so it's a very important document that instead of getting shoved in, into the dust or into the I should say, we've now made it a little bit more fun, engaging, playful. Um, but it's it's that kind of thing, just to meet uh, a client where where they are, as as you say, that I think is has tremendous uh, value and just just being real. Yeah, whether the client is a customer or an employee, mm-hmm. I dig mm-hmm. it. Awesome, um, cool. So, well, tell me so. I want to throw you under the heat lamp, the hot lamp for a minute, <laughs> like an interrogation. Oh dear, oh dear. I've already had, I already had lighting issues today. So <laughs> <laughs> just the one side that's, that's a little dark. Um, I, so we are, my company is rolling out a service product soon that is going to require us to quickly put the right seats, put the right butts in the right seats, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically, uh, video editors that are part-time to full-time contractors. They mm-hmm. edit, edit video and that sort of thing. And they need to be the right fit. Is that kind of, is that the kind of thing that you would be able to help me out with? And if so, what does that look like? Like, for example, mm-hmm. my goal for Q1, we just had a team meeting about this a few weeks ago. My goal for Q1 is to be able to hire a new video editor that is a good fit for the company culture and can take care, you know, meet our standards. Basically, I want to be able to go from, you know, initial interview to, or basically looking to hiring in under two weeks. Is that like a kind of process thing that you would help someone out with? And if so, what does that look like? Um, Yeah. And I I don't know that I would commit to a particular finite deadline, uh, particularly if I've not done a search for a very specific niche before, but, um, it may not be realistic. Honestly, I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it it is from a process perspective because ultimately what we do is it, it start, it always starts the same way with asking questions and identifying, identifying criteria. So we need to have criterion, Michael, that's legal, defensible, and and ethical. Um, Mm -hmm. but that those are the three pillars of everything I, I operate on. And so we think through, um, why does this position exist? What, what's the why? Mm-hmm. Um, what is the what is the technical skill set needed for this position to get the to get it right and to meet your standards? And then coupled with technical, what's what are the soft skills that are going to mesh or add value or add dimension to your current culture? Because that's the soft skill component is the culture. And once we have that um, that set of data, that becomes our our target shopping list. And from there, a job description is created that hopefully is not boring and is a little snazzy, spiffy, spicy, sexy, fun. Inspiring. Yeah. Inspiring that, it, that is uh, aligned with the culture and, uh-huh. and it attracts somebody of, of that ilk. And then from there, it just becomes the tactical, you know, blast, open up networks and, and find. And then, and, then, and then there is another component of the interview process. We have to be mindful of that candidate experience mm-hmm. um, during the interview process. Who, who is the decision maker? Who do they need to talk to? Mm-hmm. And how will we gauge or judge them? I usually like to have some kind of a scorecard type approach so that we keep mm-hmm. everything very fair and um, legal, ethical, defensible uh, as we do selection. So there's pre-work, then there's the search, and then there's the selection. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about legal, ethical, and defensible and what what those mean to you as you're working with a client on something like this? Yeah. The legal is pretty obvious, right? It's, it's there, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a legal, uh, illegal, and, and then there's that third area, which is very gray way to, way to operate. So mm-hmm. we always want to make sure that we are not inadvertently um, – doing something to um, cause potential for um, a discrimination claim or just or just that kind of behavior that can hurt your employer 
brand. You just, you just don't want to be, you just don't want to operate in, in those areas. And a lot of folks don't know, you know, a lot of folks, it's, it's as simple as, you know, please don't ask someone who appears to be pregnant when they're having their baby on an interview. Don't ask them their age. It really doesn't matter. Uh, just, you know, there's, there's overt things that we have to look into if we're talking about interviewing and selecting, or if we're talking about even um, something as potentially benign as training. If, if we are offering training to supervisors, are we making sure that we're offering it to everybody? Mm -hmm. um, or if, if we offer it at a certain time and you've got a night crew, is that going to have a disparate impact mm -hmm. on your night crew, which, oh, by the way, happens to be um, highly Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And is that going to have a negative impact, a disparate impact on them? Uh, and, and while it's not illegal potentially to do some of those things, it ain't right. And it ain't smart. And it, sure. and it's usually not intended for somebody with a people first culture. So just bringing an awareness to these well-intended things most of the time that could have uh, th these other impacts. So that's what I mean when I say legal, ethical mm -hmm. and defensible. Defensible comes into play when you've made a decision around hiring or uh, discipline or up, up to and including termination mm -hmm. that you need to be able to meet legal criterion for, for when something is defensible and when something is, is just, sure. and I recognize that, that we have at will language in just about every state in the union, but still um, with the courts and the decisions that have been made, we need to have just cause uh, and not just make those kinds of decisions on whims. It is not a good way to operate, period. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. How do you, how do you decide which questions to ask to reach if you, so if you've got a goal for a certain type of person you want to hire, how do you go through the process of deciding which questions to ask in an interview, for example? Well, again, I split it up typically between hard skill and soft skill. Yeah. And uh, the, here's so the defensible part is you link hard skill to the job requirements. So uh -huh. the first thing you better do is make sure you understand the job, because sometimes at, as an HR professional, we may not understand the technical intricacies of a video editor. For example, I would have tremendous amounts of questions to ask you <laughs> about video editing. Sure. Okay. Sure. So that would be the the defensible way to um, to glean out the questions I would ask on that side. On the soft skill side, I would ask a lot of questions first of in terms of de determining what we're looking for of mm -hmm. not of the candidate, but I would ask questions of the client. Tell me a little bit about how you describe your culture. How how do things get done? Um, and then folks usually have a hard time answering that. So I, I go a different route mm -hmm. and I try to ask them um, questions so that I can get a, a sense of how frequent is communication, how formal or informal are things? What does that look like? What do people wear? What time do they show up for work? Do they have meetings? If so, are notes taken? Are agendas given out or not? Mm -hmm. At that whole communication, how do things get done? Is there an approval process or do things mm -hmm. just get done? What happens when stuff doesn't get done? Mm -hmm. um, how, how equal are various employees treated? That one's sometimes a hard one, a hard one to get at. But once I get a sense of communication levels, work style things, formality, informality, then I can usually go to a question bank that I developed a hundred years ago, or just think of new questions that get at those topics. But, but those are usually the topics. And ideally you just want to match mm -hmm. what the current culture is, or um, I might have a leader that says, Hey, I'm, I got a bunch of extroverts on this team. We need somebody who's actually going to be um, a, a processor, a thinker, mm -hmm. and we need a mix mm -hmm. um, or, or we need, we need to not hire somebody who's, going to be the strategist dreamer and heads in the clouds. We need to get somebody who actually likes to look at spreadsheets and analyze data. We need 
We need help, somebody who's like that. Do you help clients analyze personality tests like a, a, a disc or a Colby or something like that? I have. Yes. Yes, I have. Um, I, I like um, predictive index personally. Um, okay. I am certified in that. I, I like Myers-Briggs a, a lot. I think it's a tried and true uh, personality type testing. Predictive um, seems like a big one for HR. That seems like a popular one that, that's very useful for HR and hiring stuff. It, it, it absolutely is. Um, you know, DISC is good. DISC is, is long yeah. and, <laughs> and, it's, and it can be expensive. So it, it sort of depends on, on budgeting. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, Strengths Finder from uh, Gallup is uh-huh. not expensive uh-huh. and it you know, if you, if you buy the book, you get the assessment free. And so I, I also have to look with an eye on what can the clients afford, but yes, I think those things are great. Um, in combination with a lot of dialogue and common sense, Mm -hmm. they are not to be just, um, followed blindly, put it that way. Okay. Yeah. That tracks, that tracks. This is great. We're coming up on the the end of the hour. I want to be respectful of of your time, but one more quick question before we go, you mentioned, um, in, in kind of the hiring process, you didn't use this phrase, but, but coming up with maybe kind of something like a scorecard where it gives you a way to, you know, objectively rate, um, a a process, a hiring prospect. How do you come up? Um, what, what, what kind of process do you go through when you're thinking about something like that? Um, I try to quantify things so that we can get it down to numbers. Sometimes it depends on the client. So if the client is uh, a very creative type, this will be agonizingly painful and I'll try to go a different route seriously. Um, but, um, what I try to do is use a five point rating scale, mm-hmm. um, one, two, three, four, five. Why is it, um, now sometimes I've used a four point, which, which forces you to not pick the middle, uh-huh. you know? So it just depends on the, the, the personalities that I'm working with. Okay. Um, so either a five point or a four point numeric scale, uh, for each question that is answered mm-hmm. and every person that gets interviewed is asked the same set of questions. Uh-huh. So it's really apples to apples. And then we have a debrief session where everybody explains their rating so we can calibrate. Mm-hmm. And then from there we have numeric scores. Now we don't always force the person with the highest numeric score to be hired, but we have discussion around it that, um, makes whoever we hire a defensible hire because there's been conversation we notate. And then those notes I recommend always be kept, um, and digitally kept somewhere in a, in a file for a certain period of time, just as a, as a formality. But I think it's important to be able to defend everybody that you hire. And then for creative types, um, the other kind of scorecard that I use is more closer aligned with net, uh, prom- promoter score, the NPS piece of it, where you have, um, um, you know, strongly agree, agree, uh, strong, uh, disagree, strongly, uh, disagree, you know, that, that kind of thing, but you just yep. take that scale and you translate it into words and it relieves a lot of anxiety for the, <laughs> the, the creative types. It's, it's funny how it's the same thing, yeah. but when you make that change, it makes a big difference, but e- either way you can, you can get a gauge of, um, how candidates stack up, which uh-huh. is which is exactly what you want to do. And the richness is in the dialogue of the debrief after the interviews. That's where the richness is because sometimes um, I saw something in a candidate you didn't see and we talk through it and what does that mean to the team? And and really the 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 other piece that is very important is that all those folks gain buy into that person's success. So when the hiring decision is made, You've got multiple hands in it, mm-hmm. and they they are all theoretically responsible for the success of this person, and and their egos are sort of going to naturally hold them to that. Yeah, awesome. Really, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. You're welcome. Yes, thank Is you there, so much for inviting me. I appreciate of it. Of course, of course. Is there anything that we didn't touch upon that I didn't hit on that you would like to bring up before we wrap up? 
Uh, I don't think so. We've covered my passion for ice fishing already. So I think we're complete. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. Um, fantastic, Millie. Uh, so yeah, Millie Chrisman from Marathon Growth Management. That's uh, marathongrowthmgt.com. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you so much for joining us on the Remarkable Coach Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all our listeners and viewers out there. We'll see you guys again next time. Cheers. Cheers.